Hello. Hello. Um, I am on my new laptop, so hopefully <laughs> it won't be glitchy. It already looks better. It's less terrifying. Um, <laughs> this it's it's time, ladies. Should I do the thing? Should I just jump straight into the thing? Let's go for it. Let's go for it. Uh, it's just gone quarter past eight. This is history after dark. We call it that because when we made it, it was winter, like it is now. So it was dark. It also fits because on our other platforms, we are the soul of discretion and decorum. On this one, we like to do our usual thing of sharing our historical knowledge as far as it exists. Uh, but while doing it over here, we do like to indulge in some four letter expletives, some innuendo, and some general vulgarity. So, with that being said, if you happen to be in an open plan office with a judgmental boss, put a headphone in. If you are in a car, a living room, a kitchen with a small child, this child's a problem. We call this child Timmy. He's so bad we made mugs about him. Timmy is a problem. <laughs> Timmy is the sort of child that hears one depraved thing one time, locks it away in his mind palace, takes it into school with him, and then he tells his teacher this depraved thing. And this teacher, in my mind, is like Miss Honey from Matilda. She does not watch History After Dark, and thus she does not know the first cardinal rule of History After Dark, which is, if you don't know what it means, it's not for you, don't Google it. So Miss Honey Googles it, obviously. And that means that she is now in a corner crying, and you've been called at the school to explain why Timmy knows this thing, and also to ask if you will very kindly pay for the next 12 weeks of therapy for Miss Honey, who is now officially broken. So... Put a headphone in. Alternatively, if you can't put a headphone in, do please feel free to watch us on the playback. I say that. It's always worth watching us live because there is a very real possibility, frankly, we are due, that we will say something so unspeakably awful, so terribly borderline illegal, that we will have to yeet this footage into the sun. It's happened once before. So that either means we've got less vulgar, unlikely, our inhibitions and standards have dropped I think the 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 is in hell, or we are due for some absolute unmitigated filth. We did talk about the first rule. If uh, if you don't know what it means, don't Google it. Uh, the other rule that we have, we hope that you're all adults here, please. With that being said, uh, this will never be a drinking game. If you want to drink along, that's up to you. But we are not responsible for your renal function. This will never either be legal advice as well, so don't sue us. And last, by no means least, having crafted meticulously this absolutely gorgeous warning before we start uh, if at any point either in these comments or elsewhere on our own social media i see someone go i really enjoy history after dark but i don't like how much you swear we know what you're doing your hope is that we're going to pin that comment so that you can be like ri ritualistically shamed in the comment section and look a shaming kink is fine it's cute for you but <laughs> without consent is not okay because if you want some dominatrix called Madam Hardballs to scream at you and call you a piece of shit on her shoe, there is there are Brighton basements full of women who want to earn a living. We aren't charging for that service, so don't bring us into it. Thank you. <laughs> Love you. That was our disclaimer. Let's begin. <laughs> awesome. You know an awful lot about these women in basements, Kat. Is that what yours is based on? Your sex dungeon, is it based on all those um, dodgy basements you saw whilst you were living in Brighton? Is it modelled on those? I'm sorry, I missed that. What? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no comment. No comment. Okay. No, that means yes. no comment. No comment always means yes. It's my uh, hoodie turned up. Yay! Oh, has it got the new name on it? I've not seen it with yeah. the new name. There you Something go. There you go. Now, now, this is where you tell me that I spelt it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, was right. no. I found out it wasn't legal and I can't be bothered to do it again. <laughs> oh, honestly, it was so much hassle. Don't ever change a name unless you really. <laughs> I've not. I've not stood that for a lot. The thing is, though, you got married and didn't change your name. I didn't even get married. I still changed it. <laughs> oh, honestly. Just no effort. Anyway, it's all yeah, there. it's done now. The rest is a nightmare. So yeah, change your name is even worse. Right, there's lots of comments. Well done, everyone. No idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't we value we... your input and your interaction. <laughs> <laughs> we'll catch up. We will catch up. Yeah. It's. I know. I've, I've already been distracted. Oh lord, there's a lot of comments. Yeah, yeah, that's what oh, I was saying. I'd be too distracted. I'd have to go back and 
Work but, it out. We are we'll, we'll start... talking about Darwin, so that's a nice little yes, they're gray in look. Yes. Yeah, so um, mm -hmm. Melissa's saying V for victory, but I can't do the V because I haven't got enough fingers. But um, I was on my live earlier and I think I did a thumbs up. I did something and it did a balloon. Oh, there you go. <laughs> and I did I did a thumbs up or I did something and it did a balloon with uh, sorry, little bubbles with a thumbs up in it. So nice now we're like, right, what, what other gestures are there? Um, Yeah. So there you go. You can do oh, that. I can't, I'm not going to try that one. <laughs> I feel robbed. What? What? What is that? <laughs> what are you? Doing? What form of witchcraft is this? <laughs> there you go. Now I'm getting the bubbles as well. What? Why? Why is? I don't like it. You've got to sit still, fidget bum. That's what you've got to do. You've got to do it I'm and hold still. At, I'm not very good at sitting still. Uh, oh, balloons. Oh, that one's your face out. I'm very sad. <laughs> That's never going to get old. I'm going to do that a lot now. I know that exists. <laughs> Pretty picks, but cats a witch. We Reasons need to know if you other... change your name to something easy to spell. You are correct. I should have moved on. <laughs> yeah, if you're going to go to the effort, why did you choose a name that nobody has ever Paris heard Street of? Paris Street said, did you just choose <laughs> Catherine R? I was like, why did I not do that? I have to spell both names. I'm so used to it. I, literally, I say my name and it's followed by the spelling of. And my second name and it's followed by the spelling of. Yeah, Every time. It just rolls off the tongue now. No one ever gets it first time, which is fine. Yeah, I just can't remember the C books without the E, but now I have to spell Ibbotson. Someone says it's StreamYard plus Apple. I have both those things, but it is me. <laughs> so therefore, I probably have neither of them <laughs> at the same time. <sighs> right, I suppose we should. I'm mean, wondering if there's any other way. Anyway, that's what I'm sure we'll find them. <laughs> no, this is more important than Charles Darwin. And this is where I am still amazed I'm under the theory of evolution. I'm amazed I'm still here. Um, but oh, oh, I'm not happy about this. I am because it's cool, but I'm also not because mine doesn't work. It does work. Like Melissa says, you don't hold the pose for longer. You've got to strike a pose and stay there. What, what right. pose should I strike? I don't know. It doesn't work. It's not going to work. Stop walking it's for a second and just hold it. Just can't do it. Maybe it won't work. <laughs> wow, tech hates you. It does. It actually, does. Actually um, hate me. It actually does hate you. Oh, well. Like, Who's starting them? I'm starting, I think, oh, yeah. aren't I? So we're talking about Charles Darwin today, hero of the, I was going to say, it's not nature, it's natural. What is he called? He's, he's the father of evolutionary theory in mm. biology. Uh, so I thought I'll take you up to kind of where he got into the bit that got him there. So let's talk about his background. So he was born 12th of February, 1809. Charles Robert Darwin. Um, so he actually lived through the reigns of four monarchs because he was born in the reign of George III and he doesn't die until um, the reign of Victoria. He was born in Shrewsbury, which isn't too far away from me in Shropshire. Um, his parents were Robert and Susanna Darwin. Now, his, fam his father was a doctor, which will come back, that will become relevant a bit later on. His mother might be familiar to you or her name at least because she was a Wedgwood. Her father was Josiah Wedgwood, yes. um, famous for the pottery created in Stoke-on-Trent and that industry gave the area its nickname of the potteries. Um, Wedgwood, the blue and white one? Yes. It can okay. be many colours, yeah. but blue and white is probably That's the That's a famous one, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So even if you don't, yeah, so even if you don't know, you'll probably recognise the Wedgwood. And maybe we do more because generally everyone's grandparents had something that was Wedgwood, <laughs> even if they only managed to get a egg cup. Or yeah. <laughs> coaster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a little coaster. So he was um he was their fifth child, their second son. They had six children in total. So he's quite he's only the second son, but he's quite far down the pecking order. He's the he's the fifth child 
Um, and Robert and Susanna had actually been engaged in 1794 when they were both already in their late 20s, which is fairly mm -hmm. unusual. They really are getting on. But they, this is even more surprising. They didn't actually marry until April 1976, so another couple of years on. Um, no, not 1976. Sorry, 1796. <laughs> <laughs> and the business mixed up. Oh, <laughs> it's a long time. That wasn't yeah. an engagement. <laughs> they were <laughs> really sure. <laughs> yeah, they have to make sure they're really sure. Um, and um, in the interim, Susanna's father died, so Josiah Wedgwood had died, leaving her £25,000. Ooh. Ooh. So, um, not nice because he died, but... No, not great because he died, but remembering she that, is, yeah. I don't know how old he would have been, but anyway. So by the time of their marriage, she's inherited this money and Robert's um, medical practice is also uh, well established. So I'm wondering whether that's actually why they were waiting because they was he was actually uh, doing that. Um, so like I say, he, so uh, Charles is the fifth of six children. So you can surmise that his mother's getting on a little bit. She's an older mother and she actually dies in 1817 she's only 52 and Charles is only eight years old so it Aww. is his father who alone then is sort of is bringing bringing him up but, but um having the influence on his education just so, on, the, on one side note I've just done the currency converter on 25,000 pounds in 1790 in 2017 money that is one million Nine hundred nineteen thousand and twenty-seven pounds and fifty pence. Decent. She is low domed. Low did. <laughs> so of course she's died, and there's the money for the boys' edu well for the education of the children. I didn't look into the education of the others, but so his dad's a doctor, so he's pushing Charles down the medical route, and he goes um, to university, the University of Edinburgh Medical School. Um, he worked with his dad for a bit, did an apprenticeship with his dad at the medical practice and then went off to medical school in Edinburgh. So his his father clearly wanted him to follow him into medicine, become a doctor. But the problem was that, um, and also it did seem to sort of fit with Charles, what Charles was interested in, which was the natural world. But he found the lectures dull and surgery distressing. So that wasn't going to be a very long um, career. Um, but while he was at university, he was exposed to people and ideas which challenged the orthodox religious views that that were held about, you know, evolution. Well, well, evolution was about the natural world. Um, and it's also it's also at university he learned about taxidermy. I mean, they sound like an amazingly fun lot. Taxidermy and the classification of plants. I've got a feeling they didn't go down the student union much. <laughs> well, <laughs> the right kind of plants, they wouldn't have needed to. <laughs> no, no. So, Maybe they had some hemp. I mean, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, no, it's quiet. The long winter evenings must just fly. Mm. Mm. <laughs> when you're chewing on the head of an opium poppy, I'm sure they do. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so basically his lack of interest in and aptitude for medicine meant that his father had to think of a different, <laughs> his frustrated father had to think about moving him. So he moved him from Edinburgh to Christ's College, Cambridge. So you can tell they've got some cash behind them because mm -hmm. that one didn't work. We'll go here. Um, and um, to take a degree, and, and this new path was to take him along the route of being a parson. So you can't be a doctor, you're going to be a, a preacher, basically. So, um, so I've written here, in what I can't help thinking of, <laughs> thinking of as peak geek, he began a beetle collection. <laughs> Love it. No. After being inspired by his cousin and fellow Cambridge student, who was a collector of butterflies. So honestly, so Edinburgh sounded like a load of laughs. Cambridge, eh, even better. So um, but he comes becomes acquainted with some people called they called Parson Naturalists. 
not naturists. I must get that right. <laughs> um, That's a different club. <laughs> it wasn't in his bio, but he um, and um, they they were clerics who saw the study of science, natural science, as an extension of, and therefore not at all in opposition to religious study. So this was a that, this was a different way of thinking, mm. um, and they believed that God actually wanted them to explore and understand the wonderful world which he has provided. Um, so they, because they, they assumed, they had a point of view that just the sheer complexity of nature was evidence in itself of the existence of God, that it must be by design. It's so complex mm. that it must be by design. And so therefore that's um, evidence of God. So this is not at all in contrast, but it, of course it does start to, push against the orthodox religious views. Um, so Darwin aspired to become one of these parson naturalists and um, and looked, and so he was studying heavily natural theology and philosophy. Um, um, but uh, although he was he was really keen on reading and learning, he was he was also very keen on contributing he didn't just want to learn and he wanted to get out there and, and sort of pursue stuff um so he planned a trip to Tenerife after his graduation um good choice yeah you know maybe maybe he was actually gonna do something slightly oh, rebellious or something. but yeah no to study the natural history of the tropics but before he um, he left, he got a letter from his uh, friend, a mentor and professor from Oxford, a guy called John Stevens Henslow. And he actually, bearing in mind that we know Darwin's got some money behind him, this Wedgwood money behind him, um, Henslow thought that he'd be a good candidate to be on the self-funded um, uh, um, expedition to explore the, or sorry, to chart the coastline of South America. So um, the, the, other, the advantage of being, not only can you afford to be part of the expedition if you've got the money, but it means that whatever you do, your work on the expedition is your own because you're not being funded by someone. If you make a collection or you make that work, that is your own. So that was the, that was the other benefit or the other advantage and um, pull for going on this trip. So um, so his reticent father did fund the trip, um, um, despite him thinking well, it, it was going to be a complete waste of time. And also, um, he was supposed to be going away for two years. Uh, uh. Now, this, of course, is the famous HMS Beagle voyage, which mm. lasted for five years. So I'm sure his dad was ecstatic. Can you imagine? They thought yeah. they were dead or whatever. And then he just rocks up and goes, hi. Ah, oh, nice of you to show up. Yeah. <laughs> Been a while. Know. Fuming. So, <laughs> and incandescent. <laughs> so he got, um, he got, there was, there's some amazing experiences. Maybe Catherine will go into, I don't know, but he had on this, on this ship. They went loads of different places. And he, he obviously got exposure to the natural world, but also different ways that human beings are living across the world as well um much of which disturbed him greatly he was um from an abolitionist family and he but he saw slavery um one particular place it, tierra del fuego um he described as seeing miserable degraded or the, the people as miserable degraded savages um although despite that remained convinced that um that everyone every human being he met across the world did have some sort of shared origin that they were somehow interrelated even though at this point he he hadn't worked out how he thought that was actually the case that was just that was that was a, a viewpoint he had that he needed to work on um so um yeah so that's how he gets on to hms beagle and also by the way he's very seasick so that's, that can't have been pleasant. But out of the five-year voyage, I think he spends, he's, I didn't write it down, but he spends a lot of it, he's actually on land. He's not on the boat. Mm -hmm. So um, they must have been stopping off at uh, port quite often. But I yeah. think they just got places and went, we like it here. 
<laughs> they just stayed for a bit and did some stuff and they went well we should probably get going had a barbecue had to barbecue with the Galapagos Islands tortoises on it. Apparently, he really liked those. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there we go. There you go. Yes. Because yeah. then he can, it, it, everything that he collects, everything that he has mm. done is his own because he's self funded. So, mm. all those beetles. I don't know how he stored them. It's interesting. But yeah. Well, apparently, he said quite a lot of them were getting sent back as he went along. Ah, interesting. So, um, yeah, so then, of course, when he got back, it's like the Amazons arrived at my house. And <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, he, he also did know about the sort of the scientific method of how to preserve various things because um, quite a lot of it, the specimens um, that he sourced, so to speak, um, are in the collection of the Natural History Museum. Um, and... I believe some. So I think the way the Natural History Museum, and I'm maybe I'm happy to be correct on this. I did work there for a little while. Um, the Natural History Museum, if something is the first version of it to be identified, so like this is the first one we found and identified as a different species, it has like a different sticker on it. Oh. Um, so, and and if you are in London and have time to go to the Natural History Museum. Then if you are, I believe, over 12, maybe the 14, you can do their behind the scenes spirit collection tour. So you can go into the place where they've got all of the preservation stuff. And the old form of spirits are, are quite stinky, which is why you've got to be a certain age to do it. And I think you, you can't be pregnant and stuff like that, or you should be advised if you're pregnant. Um, they are in the new specimens uh, and, and in some of the ones they're changing over, they are removing them from the more toxic spirits to try and uh, preserve them for longer but yeah darwin's darwin's collection is still very much on display and in use particularly uh his birds his uh and yeah they're they're very much still on display at the natural History museum as are his texts well of course he'd learned taxidermy yeah. up in edinburgh yeah. vital well which turned out to be incredibly useful bear in mind he didn't know he was going to do this at that time isn't it amazing mm um yeah he sounds very um re not regimented sort of but well, organized then in the way he did things yeah i think they do have a display of how his one of his specimen drawers was laid out and it's sort of very like everything in its place and a place mm. for everything um but yeah so it's 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 interesting the stuff that they have of his at the nhm so mm. if you're around do check it out Mm. And in some ways, the Natural History Museum, he sits in the main hall in a big statue. Um, and I feel like it, it it really fits him. I mean, it fits a lot of people of his time because lots of people think when they come to the Natural History Museum that it used to be a church, but it was actually mm. purpose built to hold that collection. Mm. Uh, and it was it said, but it was modeled on essentially being a church to the study of the natural sciences and what's really interesting i'm going to stop geeking out for a second what's really interesting is if you look at the animals that are on the on the various bits of the brickwork mm. it is in two wings and it's supposed to be uh, animals that are extinct and animals that are not extinct but in some oh. cases things that they thought were extinct when they built it have now been found to not be extinct ah. so, um yeah that's cool. amazing. I right. have been the Natural History Museum for years and years and years and years. It is a stunning building. Um, I can see yeah, it, they, call, they call the formaldehyde preserve thing the spirit collection. That's what they call it. Because, right. yeah, spirits as in the, not yeah. spirits as in <laughs> alcohol and whatever. Yeah, I don't, I don't always know. Geek out. Always geek out. Always geek out. But they call it the spirit collection. And yes, it is preserved in, in some are preserved in formaldehyde and a whole bunch of other things. Mm. Mm. It is what it is. Page petition for Dr. Cat to geek out more. It will happen. I, I mean, yeah, I had uh, it was the Naturalist Museum is a really cool building. Mm. It's a really cool building. Such a long time. It's amazing. Yeah. That was part of uh uh Albertropolis. Altrop I don't know how they tried to put it together, but basically all that Albertropolis, yeah. which doesn't really work, does it? But that whole Science Museum, DNA, yeah, all of that. All that together. 
Yeah, for Prince Albert. Mm. Very mm. good. Yeah. Now, is it time for... Man, the some museums are super haunted. <laughs> they are. Um, is, is it, it time really for... a museum if it's not super haunted? I don't want to go <laughs> Is it time for word of the week, word of the week, boom, 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 word of the week, word of the week, and I believe it's mine. It is. I mean, only one oh. thing. Get your can out. <laughs> <laughs> get your can out for the lads oi 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 i'm proud of that i am proud of myself where was it <laughs> i am proud of myself right um cunny thumbed oh no that sounds rude that sounds very rude cunny thumbed. Sound. um i tell you what i would never partake Oh, it must be bad if Cat wouldn't well, do I'd it. I'd never partake. Tis, tis a line that I will never cross. The only thing I know that you won't do is have a drink. <laughs> I wonder what the <laughs> hell you were going to say then. I think that might be the only thing I've ever known you say you won't do. It's not booze related. Oh. This is the exact... Oh. This, this sort of behaviour... If I ever saw my son doing this, I would be mortified. Cunny oh, thumb. Hang on a minute. Or you, cunny is, thumb. Is it, is it a very old name for being a, being a Ricardian? <laughs> no, no. I got attacked by a Ricardian today. Anyway, that's another. That's, <laughs> here we go. Yeah. What, in the street? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's only a matter of time. No, oh, yes. On, online. Um, pretty big. Not just for men. We could, we could all be cunny thumbed if we were wrong. And that is a way to get really badly hurt. Okay, so is it violence? Sexual Adjacent, violence. It's related. Um, Shouted out? No, it's got to be more than that. Cunning oh, is it something like like wolf whistling type idea? No, no. shall I tell you? Yeah, it's, it's got to be oh. rude. That is cunny thumbed. Making okay. a fist with your thumb inside. Never do it. That's how you break your thumb. <laughs> this is the correct way to make a fist. That's cunny thumbed because that is thought to be, and I quote, "This is." This made me angry. <clears throat> <laughs> Double one's fist with the thumb inwards, like a woman. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, I wish I make a what fist woman? Ain't this woman? Ain't never this woman. You're never going to see me yeah, cunning thumbs. Who does that? For free. Yeah, exactly. Oh, who does, does that? that? Who would make people a... who are cunny thumbed? <laughs> yeah, yeah. People who don't know how to punch. We should all learn how to punch. Just saying. Michelle, that's why it's delightful because it sounds utterly disgusting, but you can, with abandon, use it in polite conversation. You can tell someone not to be cunny thumbed. But of course, the reason why it's called that is because women have cunnies, and so yeah. doing this means you're cunny thumbed. Well, that's why I thought it had a sexual connotation, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Pace, just to believe my son will be, be learning to punch from me. And actually, also, he will learn to grapple from his daddy. His daddy did judo, and I was a boxer. He'll be small but aggressive. That's what we like. <laughs> I'd like you got that already. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that. he's a head butty biter. It's already happening. Oh. <laughs> oh. There we are. There we go. Right. Merry Wednesday. It is. It's always the Wednesday. The time goes very fast. Uh -huh. It does. It does. I've got middly bits today. I found Charles Darwin very interesting. Very mm. interesting indeed. Um, right, so Philip has kind of obviously given you a little bit of introduction. When she's brought us on to the Beagle for his quick pop round the block, I'd have bloody killed him when he came back. I'd have been incandescent with rage that he's popped off for two years and come back five years later. I've got a feeling maybe he liked being away from his dad for that long. <laughs> Actually, the reality is they were only down the road. They just pretended they were away. <laughs> oh, and, he, and he's such a—he's clearly such a geek that he. I, 
he probably didn't even realize it was that many years i imagine <laughs> no sense of time at all whatsoever fun. Okay, so I'm sure you've all heard of the theory of natural selection, which in a nutshell is everything comes about through very slow generational change. And now, obviously, what we see is things are changing faster than ever. So it would be interesting to kind of see how that, that layers on, really. But it was very revolutionary, very controversial at the time, as we'll see as we go through, because it just... Now, having said that, he wasn't the only one looking at these ideas at the time. You know, his father and his grandfather had um, sort of talked about trans transmutation and things like that of species and looked at examining things in different ways and relating them to religion. Um, so it, it's he was he was at university, but he was also very much surrounded by people who were bringing this type of thought to the front of discussion um, in in, in terms of um, the natural, the studies of the natural world, geology, and so on and so forth. Um, but I think famously, what sort of was standing them back was that there was a lack of empirical evidence for a lot of things that people were putting forward. So it was all just kind of ideas and perhapses and maybes, and, and we needed people to sort of come together and push this. And there wasn't that sort of motivation at the time. Um, but there's a guy called John Baptiste Lamarck who was saying that offspring, he kind of came in with this and he said, right, offspring can inherit um, inherit biological traits from their parents. And now, now this seems really obvious to us. And there are some people you only have to look at them to see they are the carbon copy of one of their parents. You know, So how this hadn't quite occurred to anyone before seems a bit strange to me, but I, I don't know. Obviously, Especially things when it's commented on that, you know, Elizabeth first had her father's red hair yeah or, like, i'm not quite sure why people like aren't army. going oh, hang on a moment <laughs> there seems to be you know anyway so most but most things pe people thought were they thought they were immutable they were unchanging they they couldn't there was no concept of things developing like this god had made things this way and that's what it was it, it was it was kind of set and it wouldn't change it was very created in a very specific way so during the voyage on the Beagle, Darwin was looking at different theories of evolution, though it wasn't really termed evolution at the time. If you read Origin of the Species, I have read some of it, but it was many years ago. He doesn't particularly use the word evolution. It's more something, I think it's in there, but we've kind of laid it on. It's become more commonly used over time. But Philippa mentioned all the encounters with the indigenous peoples across the world. And that made him sort of look at this and start to consider evolutionary biology because in different parts of the world people were very different and this is where he kind of came up with the idea that humans shared a common ancestor now at this point he wasn't kind of going and it was the slime that came out of the water mm -hmm. it was like a common ancestor in terms of um, a person you know people came from people sort of thing and so that was kind of the theory at that point. And, you know, Philip had said he'd seen the different indigenous peoples and he'd looked at how they were treated. And that was very shocking for him. But essentially, at the end of the day, it began to make him think about how you have all these people, but they're very different for all sorts of different reasons, as um, depending on where you are geographically. And previously, racial differences had been seen as divinely created with, of course, that really tasteful hierarchy but yeah okay and and to be fair fair to darwin he was a bit of a product of his time so we, we're not trying to excuse sort of unpleasant behaviors and, and trains of thought but that's kind of how it was rightly or wrongly so then he went further and this really upset people by saying that actually humans and animals um have a common ancestor and people really really didn't like that at all so anyway, so the most famous possible part, there are so many places he visited and I, I didn't write all that down because there's so much of it, was the Galapagos Islands with said tortoises. So that's probably the most famous part of one of his voyages. And Emojis. while he was there, he was there a long time and he did a lot of you know very scientific work there. He really ploughed a lot into this. And... um. He saw the various, so they made it back to the birds that Philippa mentioned. He, he studied the bird life. So there's lots of little islands and they're very similar. But um, he observed that as he went to the different islands, you would have the same bird. So mockingbirds in this case, 
but they were all slightly different on each island. It, a lot to do with shapes of the beaks and things like that. And so he made this observation and that made him start to question why this was. But his work actually took several decades to all come together for him to sort of really click all these things into place. So he was making these observations and putting theories together, but it was a while before it all kind of went and just fell into place completely. So they were similar to those on the South American um, mainland, but they all had these little differences. And um, the, the birds with the beaks were the big ones. So he collected several of these, and but he ignored the tortoises, even though he was told quite specifically that you could tell the diff where which tortoise came from which island by the shape of their shell. But I think that the people seem to he didn't bother too much with that because he was too busy eating them. <laughs> to be bothered about the rest we had the birds we don't need the tortoises as well so um he published some papers on this um later and this early findings sort of really underpins the work that came and um so it was regional differences suggested adaptation due to the local environment particularly um in terms of food so the different beak shapes were because the, the, the food sources that the animals had, they needed different beak shapes to be able to access the food, to break into nuts or to burrow for small animals, beetles, things like that, that type of thing. Um, so when he got, so he was on this long voyage, so I haven't gone into like lots of details to what he did on the beagle. It's just kind of this, this general observations, really. Um, but when he got back five years later, um, he went to Shrewsbury where his family were. They were delighted to see him, I'm sure. And then he organised all his specimens or a lot of them had been sent back and he put them on an exhibition in Cambridge. Now, he'd been sending letters back with these um, um, specimens and things. And um, he didn't know that excerpts of these letters had been published. So without him knowing, he was actually quite well known a lot of people knew who he was and elements of what his theories were so he's a bit of a celebrity really um, that must be very other... sorry that must be very strange in yeah. the time that he lived as well yeah no one knows yeah. who you are you've come back and a lot of the leading scientists at the time as well knew who he was too so that enabled him to start mixing with all of these people, which was obviously very advantageous. And some of them really supported his theories and his work and went along with it. And some were absolutely shocked and mortified and absolutely disgusted. And obviously a lot of theologians and theologians and people like that weren't very happy with him. So he wrote a lot of papers over the years. And for a long time, these observations and thoughts were almost just like a hobby. They were a sideline to the rest of the work that he was doing. He was still working on this idea of transmutation and those theories. And he spoke to people that were involved in selective breeding. So for example, farmers who um, want to breed the best animals for producing the best milk and the best, you know, the best meat and so on and so forth. Stronger animals for helping in the farms and things like that. And um, including pigeon fanciers as well. So he said to them, how do you manipulate the genetics to get to make sure you are getting the very best of what you've got. So he spoke to them as well. How did they pick the stock for breeding? And um, so that is artificial selection, but he could see a sort of a parallel. One, one was natural, but he could see how then this was could be manipulated to people's advantage. Now he had quite bad health on and off over the years, a plethora of different symptoms. Nobody really knows what was wrong with him, but he was working very, very hard, very, very long. And he would quite often have periods where he just had to stop working and rest he'd and recuperate. Very well. He'd be very lucky if he spent five years going around like jungles and whatever without catching something. Yeah. That, lucky to come back. To be quite honest. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm just thinking if he, you know, I mean, God, I don't know, but you know, he could have picked well, up anything. Like, that is was, he had so many symptoms of so many things, and nobody at the time, particularly or since. I mean, obviously, in hindsight, we can't, you know, um, work out necessarily what was wrong, but he just had these periods of, of, of ill health where he had to stop. And of course, when he had to stop working, everything got put on hold, really. Um, so, but you know, even when he couldn't work well, he was he would still 
do a little bit of research. He would still note some of his ideas and things like that. Now, in the mid 1850s, the theory on transmutation. So we're still on just a theory at this stage, but it was getting a lot more structured. He was really starting to fit the jigsaw together a bit more. And he was writing on how species adapted to their environment. So you can see how this is building on. So a guy called Alfred Russell Wallace was also writing in 1856 about this exactly the same thing. And Lyle, who was a good friend of um, Charles Darwin's and a fellow scientist, read a paper by Wallace and ran to Darwin and went, dude, <laughs> you lose those words, dude, you need to get a shift done with this because this guy is writing about the same thing as you and you're going to miss the boat if you don't pull your finger out. And so, but Darwin knew, like, he couldn't just suddenly produce all this stuff. And what he decided to do was actually correspond with Wallace on the other side of the world. So that must have been a real lengthy process. And um, what they did was they collaborated and they published something together. Now, in the end, it went off a bit of a bang. So they came out and went, we've done this. This is amazing. This is completely new. And people went, no. Nah. OK. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's publishing a theory. This is this isn't a law. This is yes, but I mean, they thought because there was so much controversy over it, it would be this big bang. And people were some people went, Oh, that's interesting. And some people went, We don't like that. But it had been battered around for a bit, and they really thought it was going to be this big. So Wallace kind of went, right, I'm I I will support you, but he stepped back and he let Darwin lead all the rest of, of everything. And he played a good supporting role. And Darwin does acknowledge him in a lot of his work. Um so that was sort of the late 1850 1850s. So by this point, though, it's all coming together a bit more, and he worked very, very relentlessly. He starts putting a lot more of his time and energy into this particular theory now, and to make it solid. 25 years he's been thinking about this, and on the 24th of November 1859, publication, catchy title, as these people always did, on the origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favoured races for the struggle of life. You can see why it just gets called origin of species. Yeah. <laughs> so the basic premise of this is that the diversity of life on Earth um, is due to branching patterns of evolution from common ancestors. And it's aided by natural selection. So the changes that are made over the generations give these species that have these changes a better chance of survival, because basically life is about survival. And we look at that for animals, but we are animals. When he said that, people went bonkers. They didn't like that. That was really controversy. Yes. Putting us in the same category as that. Like, well, yeah. the same, right, they weren't animals. down with that at all. So, um, so we talked about the mockingbirds earlier. He also gave another example of finches, very similar, depending on how the food is available locally, the beak shapes and things like that had to adapt. So if you could do that, you could find food more easily, you'd be more likely to survive and then you'd be more likely to breed. And then those um, strong genetic patterns would come across more in the stronger breeders. And so it goes on and on and on. And then some characteristics are more likely to get bypassed in the same way. And then as if you think about the birds on the island, that expands out. And then you get subspecies of something that's very, very similar. And so basically the species adapt to the environment. It's given the best chance of survival. So um, we need to remember, so we had the, the one where they the manipulated it. So evolution is um, not it's, it's um, not a choice. It's an active process. So some people look at things like where they manipulate the horses and stuff like that for um, racing. That is not natural selection because it's forced through. It's not an accident. OK, natural selection is not an accident. It's the it's the way that everything works together. And this explains why there is such a massive diversity of species, and such a huge amounts of environments, because it, it, it's endless the way things can change. And he said that. It can never be completed. It will always just keep going. So you'll never get to like the end of time. You know, it, it will just roll on and on and on. And what we see now or in his time is the results of millions of years 
of surviving. But we wouldn't... are the product of millions of years yeah. of evolution. <laughs> I'm seeing a flaw in his theory. So, um, <laughs> yes, so she's saying like, we just it's this inherent desire to survive. We will do whatever it takes because that's what we have to do. So my, my point there, just an aside to myself, is that if we're going to do the things, so this, this is me, not him, if we're going to do things that will always ensure our survival, like moving to a warmer climate or making sure we've got food or whatever it is that we need to do, why now are we just self-destructing? Mm. Anyway, that's a completely other set of it's just something that came to my head. So people were happy to go, yeah, get it with the, th with the animals and the plants not happy to apply it to humans at all because we're animals and that just went down like a ton of bricks people i think just weren't ready for it at that stage it didn't certainly didn't fit in with a lot of the religious beliefs and attitudes at all and basically the critics of this lost their tiny minds about it and went absolutely bananas but at this point darwin was when this happened he was really really unwell and he wasn't able to come out and sort of confront this and speak about it which really upset him so the theologists went bonkers and <laughs> um, this was my, my wording the liberals took a more centered approach and some scientists saw it as deliberate this kind of goes back to what philip was saying in the beginning um there so you know it's by there's a there's a divine creator so something that they used it as something that happened that strengthened their idea of god and i suppose that might have also made it sit better with different groups of people so this opposition and support raged for many many years um wallish also published some more evidence but in the end it was quite successful and one of the advantages of it was that the way it was written was that lay people could understand it um and that helped to get a lot more people interested in science so people would come to events seminars talks and things like that so if you when you come to talk about his legacy that's very possibly in there and he became extremely extremely famous and people came to accept really the idea that there were still obviously people now who um, say it's rubbish and it can't possibly be true and, and this that and all the rest of it um in 1871 he talked more about the theory and the humans. People have kind of got over it a bit, so he kind of like investigated it and pushed it a bit more. And he wrote another catchy title, a bit shorter, The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex. And that included sexual selection because he talked about how people would look. And again, a lot of this goes back to animals. They would look to be for the best mate possible. <laughs> Sorry. So we've also got the most good looking people there ever has been on earth now i was just about to say i think quite a few of us can go back in hindsight and say we probably didn't pick the best mate i feel but, like his theory wasn't quite complete but anyway carry on yeah <laughs> so um, no i mean so the best mate and that one again if you you know you went with the big the big strong burly man and the wide-hipped woman or whatever then they were much more likely to you know these were the things that were supposed to make it make a good mate, and they were much more likely, therefore, to be by that theory. Animals. Sorry, carry on. I'm just, I'm <laughs> um, so he also said that, that was I'm obviously I'm sort of bringing this in sort of very generally and quite tight. Um, he also said, and just going back to the races are a product of natural selection, but not created separately. So when he kind of said this, like Philippa said earlier, he was kind of coming forward a bit and saying, no, I, 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 I'm not happy about this. But then, so it upset the racists a little bit. But then <laughs> he classified different human races into a hierarchy. So he was getting, and the Lord giveth and he taketh away. But um, he, as we said, he was kind of a bit of a product. So he was starting to sort of move forward with all these things. So he was more free thinking, obviously, than a lot of people of his time. He died on the 19th of April, 1882, in very poor health of heart failure, age 73. And he's buried at Westminster Abbey next to Isaac Newton. So that's quite fancy. Not bad, not bad. Yeah. Not bad, better than a kick in the teeth. Mm. So there you go. That's a very, very, because I could have written like 20 pages. That's, that's a very sort of narrow overview, if you like, of what natural selection and the theory of evolution is. Mm. Mm. some people love it some people don't some people are indifferent i wonder, I wonder how because was he in his uh, you know he did live to quite an age didn't he, what did, how yeah, was 73, he 73. i wonder how much he was still wanting you know 
how much else he would have come up with after that, or whether he was pretty firm and it, whether he just sort of decided, yeah, that's that's about right. And well, he didn't have time to get the idea revolve anymore. Ah, see so what he did there. Because like we squeeze squeezebox, uh, squeezebox just put like hemophilia. Like there's there's so many things that it's like how if if how are they how do they exist if um if by virtue of that theory um they wouldn't have mated or well, wouldn't have survived um, long well, enough to mate. Hemophilia tend I mean obviously there are people who are carriers, but actually active hemophilia until very recently, a person who was not just simply a carrier but had hemophilia wouldn't or wouldn't usually reproduce they wouldn't. because they wouldn't survive childhood. Hemophilia is a slightly different actually example because if you're a carrier, it gives you um immunity to malaria. And so actually that's it's a reason a why that it served a purpose yeah i think, but if I we... think the question is when when we talk about um survival of the fittest there is of course what fittest means mm. in it could mean most violent. selection terms it could mean most violent it could equally mean right. most gentle it could be the person who has the most money it and i think within human beings and within the diversity of societies in which we live and and the the false mores that each society places upon its individuals whether that be laws faith cultures etc they invent rules to go by so suddenly fitness means you are the same social class mm. uh, you are the same faith you are cousins um whatever that that becomes what fitness is but that is not uh a what Darwin would understand as fitness that is something that we have invented and placed upon it could we have undone it then because if we've been around for yeah. millions of years before you know before real social hierarchies of money, not I mean, money like this. this is this is one of the reasons why modern life is so stressful we're not meant to live like this don't get me wrong I'm grateful for my flushing toilet and my washing machine I don't want anyone to take this away from me please but obviously because we are animals originally, we have the same instincts. And so, as like you say, as, as different things come along, it's like it's like health and safety. How many people has health and safety saved? Because you need someone to tell you not to prop your ladder up against a pair of Wellington boots, right? If you need someone to tell you that, you are clearly meant to have had an accident and died, okay? Oscar calls hospitals natural selection prevention units, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> if we didn't have all these things like modern medicine and um, heated houses and all these types of things, most of us wouldn't live as long then, as we well, do. So I, like, I've got really short sighted, right? How yeah. is short sightedness still a thing in human beings if for millions of years? So I'm not I'm not talking about the last 2000 years where we've developed society and we've developed money and we've developed social hierarchy. If we've mm. been around for millions of years before then, how mm. did we come into this past 2000 years with short sightedness, with scoliosis, with all the other shit that I've got going on? Like, how yeah. is that still there? So or we're going to see, increase, in, we're gonna see increased incidences of things like short sightedness because it became a social marker that wearing glasses was a sign of intelligence. Intelligence is sexy. Intelligence is fitness. So we have the one of the reasons we've why we've done it in, we, in a way. We, well, no, we haven't undone it. It's just fitness has changed. What we understand to be yeah, fitness. Be and okay. fit. But do you think maybe as well with something because I'm short sighted as well. Um, but is it just because now, in like in in the Western world, want of a less shit expression. We doesn't matter if we're short sighted because we found a way to even if we are short sighted, we've got glasses, we've got contact lenses. So we don't need to breed for better eyesight because we found something to yeah. make up for it. I mean, not, yeah, yeah but the thing is there are animals that are completely that are completely blind. Mm. Eyesight is not a necessity um in the animal kingdom across the board for fitness. There are other things that 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 exist that make you that make you fit um yeah i think it's i do think it's really interesting to sort of think about the way in which uh society and societies impact 
potential for evolution. What is clear, though, is that things like flushing toilets, etc., that striving is a part of the evolutionary drive. You only have to look at primates and their increasing use of tools. We are seeing increasingly specialised and um, skilled tool use among primates. We also see that when primates are in close quarters with human beings, they uh, th they have realised that language is helpful. So we are seeing evolutionary beh behaviours in evolutions in behaviours among primates that are that seem to be happening quite quickly. Seeing it in um, sharks as well. Um, yeah, yeah. Sea animals that are working out different ways to catch prey. A lot of humans and memories about being. Um, I think there's an example of a shark that's basically one of them got killed by a boat, I think a speedboat or something. And since then they, you know, they've learned how to get into where the humans are. And mm. Mm. so, yeah. And mm, there was some stuff. There's a theory, I'll just throw this in, that with uh, neurodiversity, that that's, um, and there's there's no proof of this. It's just a theory at the moment. It's like evolution of the brain because of the way the world is changing in terms of technology and things like that. And everything's becoming online and it's more linear and you're coding and you're all sorts of stuff like that. So you find a lot of people with neurodiversity very much sort of fixed like that. They find that they get overstimulated. So they want to fit into a space, but that gives them focus. So there is a theory, it's quite a lot more complicated than that, but actually one of the reasons we're seeing, and there's, there are going to be lots, but one of the reasons we are seeing an increase in neurodiversity as a percentage of the population, not just because there are more people, is because it's like the, the brain is evolving to, to cope mm. with how we have to live. And where we have these emotional regulation issues, as I said, we're not actually meant to live with this much stimulus and these many different emotions and coping things. So it's very, very stressful. And so blocking those out to focus on what's going to move you forward is kind of, yeah, well, interesting. I mean, I don't know, it's just a, a theory that's being postulated, but interesting. Yes, yeah, it's, it's the same with um, people asking why we're seeing an increasing prevalence of very serious uh, responses and immune responses to allergens, so the increase mm -hmm. in food allergies. And a few years ago, I was, when I spoke to somebody at the Natural History, History Museum who was working on stuff like that, and I was like, "Do you?" Because obviously, I've, I've got a nut allergy, and there is, a, at least at that time, there was a suggestion that a possible reason for the increasing prevalence of these allergies is because our immune systems don't know how to function in a clean in a well it, but in a specifically a world where less and less people have intestinal parasites mm -hmm. um and so because we don't because once upon a time the majority of people would have gut worms but now that is the absolute minority but our immune system has evolved to deal with the fact that we'd all be absolutely riddled We've got worms, mm. and now we're not. Our immune system's like, well, what the fuck do I do? Oh, hang on, a peanut. Let me close your esophagus. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it's the same with how we um, we regulate the temperature of our environment rather than our bodies doing it. Yeah. So, um, you know, people who are into like cold plunging and wild swimming and stuff know the theory behind this. But you know, we're we're designed to well, especially in our sort of region of the of the earth to to get cold you know we mm -hmm. can survive it it's not very comfortable and we don't like doing it now because we don't feel like we should have to because we can wear a coat or we can put the heating on or whatever yeah but actually our bodies are designed not we're not supposed to feel comfortable all the time so our body's system literally with your shiver like if you shiver you have every neuron Every tiny little muscle right down to your fingertips, nine and a half of them in my case, um, are working. They don't do that if you stay at a nice, consistent ambient temp. time. Yeah. And so actually, you're not using all of your nervous neur neurological system. You're not using all of your muscular system. And, um, and also, we have mechanisms by which we um, maintain fat stores 
in order to keep insulated. And those fat stores are supposed to be worked, but we just put them on and we don't work them. Um, and so there's all this like, you know, just in, in the, trying to remain comfortable, trying to remain clean all the time. You're right. Our bodies have got all these mechanisms in them that we're not using. Mm. And actually that is to the detriment of, um, mm. of our entire, you know, our system in total. It's yeah. interesting. I know. It is. No. And um, people saying in the comments, um, I think I might have, I don't know. People are saying that um, it's more people in terms of neurodivergence, more people or more recognition. I mean, definitely more recognition, you know, um, for sure um, than there used to be. Because now, um, for example, ASD, autism, autistic, autism spectrum disorder years ago it used to be classed as lots of different things including Asperger's and now it's all classed under under one thing and there are certainly people that I mean my eldest son um, has ASD and he's quite happy for me to talk about it very openly so I'm not talking like out of turn or behind his back but he's classed as quite high functioning so in in like however long by he probably wouldn't necessarily have been um, given the diagnosis of autism he might have just I, I don't know necessarily what exactly they would have done but he wouldn't have been seen as bad enough I know I know that's a shit expression but I'm, I'm trying to just look it's now a spectrum it's not just you have it or you don't you know and um so I think that's it we have a larger population so when yep. I was at school there was 20 kids in the class now there's 30 so if we you know when I was a kid if there was two kids in the class who are neurodiverse then there would now be three like you know if you're going to say it's a you know a, a stable percentage of the population but it you know what what causes neurodiversity is is still hotly debated a lot of people think there is a genetic link i'm inclined to agree with that even though i am not an expert in in the study of this um so we haven't broken down i think in real detail the nature nurture side of this but if there is um a nurture element of this society is changing and it is changing progressively more quickly so what used to take 100 years to change then to at the same rate takes 10 that takes one you know by the time you release a piece of software it's virtually out of date well i wonder if it's as well the difference between something physical uh, uh, like a, a i don't know like the length of our fingers I don't know, whatever or the the fur losing the fur on it or the brain which you know maybe is more malleable in some way because mm. you know you can if you learn a new skill you're creating new pathways in your brain if you can if you um you know some of us might know someone who's been incredibly clever and they and, but they get degenerative brain diseases as they're older because they've they they never did anything new they were just incredibly good at mm. one at what they were good at and so if you can manipulate your brain still you know into your 80s like my dad's now learning italian in his 80s and stuff you know he's firing off new neural paths so i wonder whether it's like with the brain that's a quicker change that you can see I mean, mm. we know we know the negative effects of, like you said, of of living in a society where we are constantly contactable in multiple ways mm. as well, um, twenty four hours a day. Mm. It's insane, um, and from all parts of the world, which we wouldn't have been aware of in a natural environment. You know, and I do um, also think there's an element to which um, certain kinds of neurodiversity are diagnosable and symptomatic because of the demands of various things you know mm. i think that i could have existed perfectly fine um and never really realized there was anything different about me if we didn't live in a world where the expectation is that to be assessed, you will have to take in information and write it down. Um, and that there is a value placed upon being able to do spelling, punctuation, sentence structure um, mm. on the hoof without anybody being there, like without any spell check or anything. Um, and that there are now no more real like oral defenses or exams. I don't mm. think I would ever have needed to know that I was dyslexic if the education system and the requirements of attainment weren't essentially set up in a way that my brain was unable to cope with. 
Yeah, I, very interesting. It's it's the difference yeah. between the medical and the social model of disability. My mm. disability only exists because so society has demands and requirements upon me that I am less able to fulfill. Mm. Um, I, mean, we, I am we, socially disabled. Not not it's not it's nothing. You know, it's 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 nothing intrinsic about me. It's about the requirements placed upon me. Yeah. It's so interesting. If you see somebody um, who can't use their phone properly, I'm going to say older person, because, but it might not be. Um, and you think, you know, it's kind of like a, um, I don't know, like as if they're not adapted to. But it, but the same thing doesn't go for everyone who can use a phone. Can you all grow your own food? Can you all fix a leak? And I don't know, you know, something more practical. That that's not um, that's not seen as sort of having much value like yeah. you know we've we've set up sites in a certain way I mean it's fantastic and now that neurodiversity is recognized and people are much more prepared to look at it because when you say autism this is a bit of a generational thing here but people always used to think rain man and I'm not like that because that's what people knew as autism now fortunate and that was, a ter that was an amazing film but obviously now we know that it, it's a lot different and one autistic person is one autistic person not everyone's the same so we have all these insights and values and people are discussing it more and finding ways in which neurodiverse people can in, we can work you know work together sounds so patronizing but I can look at someone who's neurodiverse and think you know that's going to be really uncomfortable for them if I do that and I don't need to do that so I won't and people are becoming a lot more understanding. And both my children have very understanding friends. They have some great peers, especially my eldest son. And some of them, um, uh, he's got a friend who's going through ADHD diagnosis at the moment. And it's, it's really nice to see that as a friend group, they all support each other. So I think it, we are getting a lot more diagnosis. And it, you know, I think the problem sometimes is it's interesting because you could you could say, oh, um, you know, I, I know I've got eczema or I know I've got this. And people would go, oh, yeah, you've got that. And you could diagnose yourself because you can see you've got something. But if you're neurodiverse, no one will ever accept that you diagnosed yourself. Hmm. Yeah, but of course, and I think that's the thing is that in the in the current particular, I mean, I can only speak to what it's like in the UK. Um, Self-diagnosis, particularly if it's something whereby there are mechanisms for you to uh, help yourself or ask for accommodations self-diagnosis is absolutely valid particularly when the waiting list for a autism or ADHD diagnosis is minimum five years it's awful yeah minimum five years and when we actually look statistically at the risk of people ending their existence particularly with things like ADHD undiagnosed frankly Anybody who's got a problem with you self-diagnosing um, doesn't understand how difficult and expensive it is to obtain a diagnosis. And really and truly, asking for accommodations doesn't really hurt anybody. Doesn't hurt anybody. Just be kind. Just be just be kind. Yeah. I am some of the what did somebody grow up? Yeah, there is that. There, there is also though that you can't wave a letter and you can't claim like I've had kids that when growing up with 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 one of mine who was just horrible and he would say oh but i'm autistic well no so yeah, it's, you need to learn not to be horrible like that you, you can't the push it. yeah, the, yeah Catherine, you're amazing with yours but you know he was clearly used to being told oh it's okay darling because you're whatever and i think he was he was autistic or had ADHD. no maybe he had adhd actually that would fit better but it was like no, I'm sorry. You've got to. You've got. You still can't do that. Everyone, all, everyone around you in society. That. At the end of the day, so we've all got to yeah. work together. We be pro social, but like yeah. that, the thing is, that child would be told that it was okay because he had brown hair. Like his parents would find an excuse for that behaviour anyway. It was just well, yeah, you know, that's because you've got size five feet, darling. That's why that's <laughs> happening. So it's, it's fine for you to have punched. Um, Jessica in the tits because you've got size five feet so that's why that's happened yes um, I mean neurodivergence can exist with shitty parenting um those two things are not mutually exclusive <laughs> <laughs> we've all seen it let's be honest yeah. Paige says um it's a cool fact now neurodivergence it can be a cool fact 
about you instead of something wrong or bad and certainly I know a lot of kids now say it's their superpower and I have to say that one of those moments now where you boast about your children both mine have got things so my eldest can look at something he's got his own art style but he can just look at something and draw it yeah he's amazing and he's so my, cool. my youngest is seven and one of his favorite things is times tables so we <laughs> sat down last night and did all the times tables in the 90s 93 yeah so that's the type of, you know, he's at school, he's done some algebra, he can cube root and square root and do all those types of things. So my children have, and it is, so therefore you get, and that's one of the reasons why Oscar's that quite likes his autism and thinks it's quite cool is because he goes, I can do all these things and this is my brain. Yeah, and cool. People say, well, you know, you worry about me, mum, because you say, oh, what if I find this difficult? And what if I find that? And, that and some of the things you worry about, I said, I don't care. I don't care. You feel sad because you think I'm going to miss out, but I don't care. I don't care that I'm not doing that. I'm happy doing what I'm doing. Yeah. And he's already, some of the coding and stuff that he's doing and the artwork is well in excess of even what he'll achieve at this school. So he's going to be fine. He's ace. He's going to be no, funny. He no, is, no, your, kid is, your kid, both your kids are funny as fuck as well. They are hilarious. <laughs> Hilarious. I was saying to Philippa, Oscar comes out of school, he was off last week, comes out to me, mother, a lot of tea has been spilt in my absence. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. It's he, honestly, he does, he makes me howl. He's so funny. He's got a very good attitude, that's the thing. He's got yeah. a very good attitude. He knows what the advantages are. He knows what, you know, where he might struggle. And and you are amazing at, at um you. you know teaching him yeah. to or guiding him to um yeah know how to go about those situations because he's going to come across them you're not trying to you you never give him a pass of oh it's all right yeah. you know you don't have to go to school today or whatever it would be because you're not yeah. feeling it no you're going and this is how we're going to manage it you know just going is a struggle for him but if it's not school it's going to be work or a doctor's appointment or the optometrist yeah. or getting groceries and i think he is it's just and I said to him, yeah, we obviously we talk about bullying and his 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 um his tactic with bullies is to um agree with them. You would think, <laughs> you're right, I am. God, you're right. I didn't even think of that. And just things like that. And um someone made a really homophobic comment to him the other week and he went, You are the first person I've come across that's any good at being homophobic. Well done. <laughs> it's just you know you know, it's a fucking good job that he's he's getting taller because with with a mouth like that it's a good job he's getting to be a big lad because be well, sure. uh, we've sat down and we discussed that our, our his main weapon at school is psychological warfare so we work on that <laughs> spectacular he's probably got a, he's probably got a future in politics or something yeah. it? just also be... oscar's mum is the mum Oh, tell Oscar's mum. <laughs> I'll sort your shit out. Yeah, that's the thing is you're you're that kind of you're that amazing blend of you are a fucking Rottweiler when it comes to looking after what your kids need. And woe betide <laughs> anybody who gets in your kids' way and is in is basically being ableist, you will light them up. But mm -hmm. on the flip side of that. If your kids fuck around, they're going to find out. <laughs> <laughs> yes, basically that. But you don't do your kids any favours if you let them get away with it. Do you know what I mean? No. If I just go, oh, yeah, you can say and do whatever you want because you're autistic. Everyone will hate him and you won't learn any life skills. Yeah. And yeah. I said, you are going to get bullied because you're autistic. But it's a similar premise to what Kat was saying about size five shoes. Some kids will pick on you because you're autistic. But a lot of those kids will pick on you because you're short, because you're tall, because you wear glasses, because That's you've got braces, because you have a bag with a cat on it, because it's yeah. Wednesday. You know, it's just unfortunately that's an easy target. But some people, I said to him, some people will pick on you because of your autism, but some people are just dicks. Yep. That's it. It that, that is it. You know, there, there's no there's nothing else for it. No. Um, the had school of parenting. Well, there we go. There we go. <laughs> Maybe that's the nice that we should do. We should do a, a parenting advice uh, episode. <laughs> Come to us with your parenting problems. It will always end in poison. On which note, have we got <laughs> one? <laughs> on which note, have we got one? That was that was nicely done. Oh, oh hang on. Hello. Oh, hang she's on. off. 
Come on. Anyway, let's hope no, he but... stays. Let's hope Rock he stays cool and hip it's and chilled out. out. This week, not my uh, t shirt. I think Oscar's oh, taking much. I think the one that's going to call Lucas because Lucas is just going to go off bungee jumping around the world or something and just oh, drive me to an early grave. Ladies, right. are we ready, widows? Flaps! Oh. <laughs> Dear widows, I have a serious dilemma which could have oh. fatal consequences. Mm. My brother is a terribly bad man. Ooh. He has oh. done many awful things. I dare not tell you what they are, as many people already judge me to judge me due to guilt by association. A few days ago, he finally pushed his luck too far and was arrested. He will be tried in a few days, and if found guilty, a certainty, he will be thrown into the tower, maybe to rot until the end of his time. Ooh. My family think the sun shines out of his posterior and that his arrest is a terrible miscarriage of justice. Oh they have concocted a plan to help him escape, which involves a sequence of small traps and fake accidents. To make it work, seven of us have to be involved, including me. My problem is that I hate him. <laughs> he makes my life a misery and he has done so many bad things to so many people. I would be so happy to see him get his just desserts and be rid of him forever. I could easily not play my part in the escape when the time comes, but it would be obvious that I had done it on purpose and my family would never forgive me and would punish me severely. Is there anything I can do to avoid their wrath, but still get rid of my brother? Mm. Well, he's in the tower, so I'm assuming he's quite high, quite high ranking. I, she, she doesn't state that, but that was the implication. Yes. So he's going to be getting food taken in mm. or provided somehow. Now, if you can be paid to prepare the food, you can be prepared to put. You can be paid to poison the food. <laughs> so she could bypass the whole escape requirement by just having him poisoned mm. i mean it, it's a fair point it is i mean Kat, anything the, the others i mean on an on a on a uh, connected note in the tower um, i'm assuming this escape plan is not set for tomorrow oh, so I soon i think soon, soon. what i'm going to say is that people get forgotten Ooh. And oh. you can't survive very long without water. All right, King John. <laughs> yeah, so I, say, I say put your mother in with him and let somebody eat someone's face. <laughs> oh, wow, that escalated. Quickly. I think you could take this as an opportunity, right? At a certain point, it sounds like you've got quite a lot of people in your family. If this is a seven man escape crew, Mm. You are really far down the pecking order when it comes to inheritance, my oh, friend. Mm. This could be a great opportunity in that you could dob them all in for plotting the escape. Oh, nice. And thus yes. nice. win the affections of your monarch, who will not only let you get the inheritance of the whole family estate will probably give you some more stuff. So it's either a case of starve your brother, have your brother starve to death by paying a member of the tower staff or peach on your whole family, snitch them up um, and be the king's new favourite. If if you if we are currently in the time of kings, I'm assuming we are, um, I don't know, uh, writer, if you happen to be a lady, you never know. You mm -mm. might be a future wife. Mm -mm. You could be Queen of England, but all you've got to do is stitch your family up. Yeah. Well, I mean, to me, I don't know about you, Philippa, but that sounds like quite a winning plan. <laughs> uh, no, I'm still going so, for poison. Phil, poison is possibly easier. Also, you might not, depends on who the monarch is. True. You might not want to go down that route. I mean, it could be Max Irons, though. So, <sighs> it could be Max Irons. 
worth yeah, a go. Yeah, well, so um, it depends, depending on whether it's Max Island, yeah. if Max Island you go down the poisoning <laughs> route, or you go down the grass, your family up route. I think that's that's fair. That's fair. Yeah, that, so, that's yeah. a range of options depending on that's the circumstances. Like to give you a range yeah. of options. Mm. Range of options. Mm. There we go. Something for everyone. There you go. For all callers. There you go. Right. Oh, we are we are we are running very oh. over. Um but tell us, Kat. Tell us about Charles Darwin and his legacy and other things. So uh, I'm I'm sort of left with legacy, why he's a hero, possible controversies. Uh, so principally, I think his his the argument for him being included in the heroes is that his theory and particularly like the origin of species does alter and affect the way in which we understand our world. Uh, and it continues to alter and affect the way we understand our world because uh Evolution is not just for animals and plants. It's also, of course, for scientific fields. So I have in front of me uh, a list, an expansion of the scientific field with descriptions that I'm going to go through. Now, I do not purport to be a scientist. So if these are not quite correct, then apologies. So we've got the notion of natural selection, which we've discussed already, this is the process through which, in a given environment, differences in the genetic makeup of individuals will result in differences in survival and reproduction. At around uh, a similar time to when Darwin's working, we start to get discussions about something called population genetics. This is looking into the differences between populations looking at phenomena of adaption, of uh, different characteristics that start to appear within different groups and, and um, populations. We then move on from there to the notion of developmental genetics. This is looking at the way in which organ organisms grow and develop based upon their genetic properties. And now, something that we've kind of touched upon when we were, when we were talking about this nature-nurture thing, now, of course, we have the field and the study of epigenetics, which is researching into hereditary properties that are not determined by changes in DNA. So we this is all essentially coming out of the root of, of Darwin and his colleagues. Darwin is was very aware of the possible connotations and anxieties that his work might put forward and certainly as you said when his work was published when it was published in 1859 there were there was quite a degree of outrage from members of the church of england it was he was accused of being a blasphemer and of course when there's an allegation of blasphemy attached to a printed work very much like the lady chatterley's lover is it porn or not well i know if i see it the second you call something blasphemy it becomes a bestseller <laughs> um, and the origin of species is was and is incredibly influential since its publication it has never been out of print it has been translated into at least 36 languages. Indeed, within a year of its publication, it was published in German. And in Darwin's lifetime, it was translated, as well as in German, into Danish, Dutch, French, Hungarian, Italian, Polish, Russian, Serbian, Spanish and Swedish. The library at the Natural History Museum, uh, according to their website, has 478 editions of On the Origin of Species in 38 languages, written languages, but also in Braille as well. So it's also been translated into Braille. When we look at the legacy of Darwin, this is in some ways both what makes him so amazing, but also where the, the problems start to emerge. Because for, for people looking at the arguments put in The Origin of Species, what's interesting to me is that they seem to, <clears throat> much like the Bible, interpret it in ways that suit their own designs, shall we say. Um, in fact, the 
Dictionary of National Biography entry lists and says the following, agnostic scientists, liberal politicians and broad churchmen joined in paying homage to one who, though an unbeliever, symbolised England's success in conquering nature and civilising the globe during Victoria's reign. His work stood for competition and cooperation, liberation and subordination, progress and pessimism, war and peace. Its politics could be liberal, socialist or conservative. Its religion, atheistic or orthodox. And of course, what happens then is that as these ideas start to evolve, there becomes a politics in science. Just as history is political, so is science. By the turn of the 20th century, there are, there are discussions about social Darwinism. And this is the notion of biological theories being placed upon notions of social cohesion and, socio and sociology and essentially tinkering with the social fabric based upon this idea. This then has a far darker legacy when we start to look at things like tinkering with the social system to ensure that society is the healthiest it can be. Because there are people who, I would say, pervert what Darwin has written and turn the theory of evolution into a process for species improvement. And just because Darwin breeds pigeons to be interesting colours uh, doesn't mean that he thinks that eugenics is a great idea. However, perhaps he would have done. And so his theories arguably do contribute to the practice of eugenics and thus the atrocities committed in that, in quotes, science's name. So there I think we come to the place where we see it. I don't I don't necessarily want to delve into like hyperbolic language, but when I look at the origin of species, I see it as being the biological theory version of splitting the atom. And why I say that is that on one hand, the capacity to split the atom when handled correctly, can give humanity a chance of creating an energy source that would keep everybody warm and cared for. But that same technology in other people's hands becomes something that you see creating the atrocities at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I feel like a similar thing has happened with Darwin's theory of evolution in that there are people who, for whom this becomes about the betterment of understanding and even the betterment of, of, of scientific understanding, that I, I think without Darwin, we perhaps wouldn't have, ha we wouldn't be having these conversations about um, genetic therapies that, that, will, that will definitely, without a doubt, save countless lives. But tied up in that when we when we have the capacity to tinker with genetics do we risk homogenizing society to the point whereby any form of difference is seen as an aberration that must for the good of the community be removed yeah mm -hmm. and so that's sort of where i that's i kind of think that's where i want to want to pause i don't necessarily want to go into the ins and outs of of that more than that it sounds to me though like whatever whatever technology uh improvement comes about it always falls into the hands of someone to do wrong with like you say who's coming up though with a perpetual energy source no one mm-hmm not in comparison to coming up with you know how many countries now have got nuclear um, bombs with that technology yeah. and how many of them are looking at developing perpetual sources no one they're not looking at doing it because it doesn't create enough money for etc etc so like and and even without darwin 
wouldn't somebody else have thought of um you know i can't imagine that dna the pursue the pursuance of dna of the 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 science which led to the to dna being discovered wouldn't have mm. wouldn't have happened somehow or in some form and humans all have always othered other humans it's a tribal thing i suppose and mm. that's what you get with the eugenics as well you know if if it, it's there's someone out there you have to other that in order to be able to think like that you have to be able to other them they have you to have be to create a hierarchy you have um, to create a hierarchy and they have to be faceless pointless beings that are dispensable same when you drop a bomb I do, I do just want to read something from The Descent of Man, because I mentioned the fact that it's possible, of course, that Darwin would have got on board with eugenics, but... Um, Is there any evidence that he... Well, well, we don't I, want to him with that brush if... if I, well, I mean, here's, here's the thing. It's mixed. It's a mixed bag. So, um, for example... He points out that he 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 makes he says there's a, there's a sentence which potentially points to him thinking that by some kind of natural selection women were intellectually inferior. The quota the quote goes: "If men are capable of a decided preeminence over women in many subjects, the average mental power in man must be above that of um, woman." So that sounds like there is something a notion of of genetic super or or um darwinian superiority between the sexes could that extend towards the races could that extend towards people who are um have a physical or or mental difference possibly another uh, what another phrase though in descent of man darwin writes as man advances in civilization and small tribes are united into larger communities, the simplest reason would tell each individual that he ought to extend his social instincts and sympathies to all members of the same nation, though personally unknown to him. This point being once reached, there is only an artificial barrier to prevent his sympathies extending to the men of all nations and races. So, that's why I sort of said maybe he would have got on board with eugenics because there's there's things it, that could potentially fit into both camps, I think. Mm -hmm. Steve makes a good point. He says once the genie comes out the bottle, you can't put it back in. No. Mm. Mm. I would have to read what he'd he'd written and because I, I I've never read his works so to really see I mean I know he was it, it, when I was reading about him he was distressed by what he saw about how people treated each other and you know if you're coming from a society where there's law and order healthcare of sorts schooling of sorts and you land on an island where they're selling each other as slaves and the, I don't know whatever are they it's it, like we might we're very sensitive to this stuff now but would he not be thinking yeah, I've got a slightly better at home um but then from what you just said then I don't know maybe I'm completely read think of it in a different way but isn't he not saying there that there is no actual reason for everyone to be on the same level and equal I, I maybe i completely yeah on the, on the one hand he seems to say that there's an artificial barrier that puts up notions of difference between men of nations and people however he's also saying that there is a barrier and a difference between for example men and women of the same nation right, so within the species right. he is he is mm. able to he he, he mm in some ways contradicts himself. But I think as with so much of his texts and so much of his works, you, like I say, it's like the Bible because it's open to interpretation and it can be spun and read. Mm. And maybe in, he was working this through still. Yeah. It's a theory. He's working it through. Who's to say if he didn't live for another, you know, <laughs> if he uh, could have lived even longer, I don't know, that he, he surely would have come up with the next sort of idea and stage and 
Maybe. I, I think it's I think it's really fascinating. And I think mm. when we come to sort of talk about him as a hero or otherwise, um the, the some of the more unpleasant legacies of his work are going to be a sticky point for us. Um, and I think that this is something to take in mind when we think about how we're going to score things, because arguably, uh, it, at least in part, his his work and his theories contributed to um, and maybe formed a cornerstone for a theory that was that was then so exceptionally weaponized that it caused one of the greatest atrocities known to the world so can Don be blamed for that no mm. but it is still his legacy so how do we how do we manage that how do when we're I mean I mean it doesn't it doesn't really affect Charles Darwin and his legacy the score that we give him next week but I think it's something that we have to consider and going forward um when we talk about various people particularly people who have impacts of a similar ilk we're going to have to think about that legacy side of it. Mm. Well, we'll come back to that next week mm. because we're going to be scoring all four of our first, our first four history heroes. So we had Anna of Cleves. Who else have we done? Do you remember? Boudicca. Boudicca. Um, also, Capability <laughs> Brown. Capability Brown. Good job you're here. Capability Brown. And of course, Charlie Darwin. Charlie Darwin. Of course. Good range, so. isn't it? That's good range. It's good range. And we will um, introduce how we will be scoring that at the beginning of next week's. <laughs> well, it's going to be a furious about next um, mm -hmm. voice note <laughs> in the WhatsApp group between us while we're going, how. <laughs> Are we going to score this? I'm pretty sure we wrote down something somewhere at some point. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be fine. Yeah, we'll definitely have worked it out by next week. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. Um, so that's what I was going to say. What's happening next week? Well, that's what's happening next week. It's Roundup Week. It's Roundup, roundup Week. Roundup. Yeah, so I'll be making some jinglies, no doubt. Ooh. Oh, I was looking forward yeah. to that yes. in particular. What's going to be our version of the culpability jingle? Who knows? We've got to think about what the score's going to be. <laughs> we'll think of something. Someone, Good someone made a suggestion last week. I did write it down. Yes. Yeah, so something that's easy to rhyme would somewhere. be super helpful. <laughs> something that's easy to stick in super the helpful. lyric. Also. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you can support us if you should so choose at www.buymeacoffee.com forward slash head podcast that is where you can go to buy us little bitty winnebagos um, it's Bago, also where you can go to join our close friends on the instagram where we mostly Catherine, finds <laughs> obscene right. shit and puts it <laughs> <laughs> on the stories for you to laugh at uh, and it's it's a it's a good luck um so you can find us over there we also have a sub stack that will at some point become oh, the uh oh, it, will. it will some at some point become all of the things you need it to be that is history after dark hub dot sub stack dot com we have merch that is in our link tree uh you can find that you can buy mugs Sliders, hoodies, t-shirts, apparel. We have some fabulous beavers for you to <laughs> come and check out our, uh, our beavers. They have a rough. They, we've got some rough beavers over there. We have, we have, uh, yes. some rough beavers. Uh, <laughs> uh. <laughs> what else? Um, please do make sure that you have liked this live. Make sure you are subscribed to History After Dark over here on the YouTube's. And uh, when you do subscribe. Hey, there she goes. Click the thumbs up as well, uh, beside. And when you when you subscribe, also go to the bell icon and then select all in the drop down that will appear. And that way, YouTube allegedly will tell you when we have next uploaded, um, or rather, I should say, when we are next planning to go live. We do also upload shorts, so do check those out. Um, what else? What else? What else? Something else. There's something else I'm forgetting that I need to say. 
You can send your past problems and past problems post back to History After Dark 2021 at gmail.com. Mm-hmm. Gosh, 2021, and now we're in 2024. Yeah. The first had was some date in March 2021, so it's almost three years since the first had on Clubhouse. Wow. And look at us. We now. have been talking shit for a long time. <laughs> But it's and we'll funny. continue to do so. We will continue to do so. Oh, look, stop showing off now, <laughs> both of you. How I, do you not? How do you not? <laughs> I have no idea because it's me. Is is? <laughs> Boop. <laughs> what about if you do? I don't know. You have to wait a bit longer. I can't really do that. No, that's not doing <laughs> anything. I have, I have no idea. That's what I think anyway. Hang on. This is absolutely... Oh, yes. Also, Steve, you can come and find us on our own social medias as well. Um, you can find me at Reading the Past on YouTube. I'm also on TikTok, Instagram, and less so on Twitter because it's a terrifying horror show. Um, on the <laughs> other ones, on the ones that aren't YouTube Reading the Past, I've done some variation of my name which is either Cat March or Katrina March. And sometimes it's got a full stop, sometimes it's got an underscore, because I didn't think when I <laughs> made the platforms that I was going to do this for a living. So they're all different because I'm a dickhead. But come <laughs> and find me. Um, I, I I don't swear over there. You'd think it was a different person. I'm like yeah. Hyacinth Bouquet with my phone voice. Um, sure. Where can we find you, lovelies? I'm at British History on YouTube, British History Tours uh, on Facebook and Instagram. And where else am I? Um, they're the main places, really. TikTok? Mm. I am on TikTok. I've still not done much on TikTok. But you will. Yeah. I know. I keep saying that. I will. I should. I Hit Josh Drop is also on TikTok. We will do it's more things. Without, when we without two posts. With, well, one of them very well. Very well. We will hope to record him there. Um, Catherine, where can we find you? Um, I'm, uh, I don't know. Um, right. On Instagram, <laughs> I'm historical collaborator and on youtube and tiktok i still haven't worked out how to use tiktok it's the historical collaborator and i really don't generally post much but i am putting together some posts at the moment so you might see some soon shakespeare related ones mm. and then maybe once we finish the shakespeare stuff we might look at some howardy things Ooh. Ooh, um yes, linda so mentioned nice. rumble philippa i remember you you had a voice note about rumble linda's just said rumble question mark yeah and i went so, I've heard that word before. Yeah. It's, it's another, uh, it's another like uh, YouTube platform, but not one that like if we do say something that we will be have to be yeeted into the sun on YouTube, it might be able to stay up on Rumble unless we have actually slammed. Oh, good. Someone. Um, and we don't do a yeah. libel. Don't do a libel. So because we've had issues with, oh yeah, like anyway, you know where we've had to skirt round words and things like that and we can't say them well that won't be the case on rumble and anyway it won't it but we haven't set it up yet and i'm testing it on my channel which is just british history um to see how it works basically uh yeah <laughs> so. so Paige, do you make crochet beavers it's a conversation about crocheting i don't crochet or do anything particularly creative I, I'm, right. I'm cross stitching something at the moment, but I can't show you what it is because it's a gift. Ooh. So, well, you're very mm. creative, very good, amazing. So, right, tidy. Next week, yes. Yeah. Shall I count us out then? Do that. Yeah, it's been fabulous. Right. Very interesting. We're quite I'm intellectual. When we start. We've been going two hours. It's been. We're like, it's been a long one. That's what she said. On that note. We'll see you all next week. Do take care of yourselves. Behave. Be good. And if you can't be good, be careful. And if you can't be careful, don't get caught. With that being said, we're going to leave in three, two, one. Bye. Bye.